asking him to present these uh, results. So um, I'm going to talk about this quantum tests that I guess are going to be it's going to be like a new topic for most of you. Um, yeah, okay. So this this work was done in collaboration with uh, Leandro, who is here from Rio, uh, during a very fruitful visit. That so he he spent three months here in the beginning of the year. We came up with these uh, results, and then we thought, well, okay, it would be nice to have uh, some experiments supporting our results. So an experiment has been done in uh, Rome, in the group led by uh, Chiarino, and then another experiment was recently done in Rio as well. Okay, so um, this is a conference about quantum devices. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but uh, I'm going to move like to a kind of different kind of a framework, that it's what we call device-independent uh, uh, framework. So I'm not going to be, f until the end of the talk, not be really talking about any specific uh, setup. Everything I'm going to talk here is, is like valid for any setup. You can choose the setup of your interest, and then you can apply these ideas. But first, like a uh, motivation for why we care about uh, device independence and uh, what this means. Okay, so the basic problem we have in quantum information, like you give me a state, rho, and you want to know if the state is entangled or not. So the usual, so here's like uh, the pictorial illustration of the problem. We have like the set of uh, the, st the, spa the, st the, st the space of states. We have here like the separable states and the entangled states, and we want to know in which of these two regions we are. I mean, this is like very uh, coarse-grained description, of course, and one way of doing that is like we can design some uh, this hyperplane here that it's entanglement witness, and it's uh, we can associate this W, this entanglement witness, this entanglement uh, witness to a physical observable. We can measure this in the lab uh, and compute the expectation value, and if this expectation value is negative, we can be sure that uh, this state is entangled. So it's fine. It's the usual way of, of doing things. The problem here is that uh, when we do things in this way, we have to be sure that what we are measuring in the lab is really this uh, observable here. Any experimental deviations from, from this observable W, from, from this witness here, is going to lead like, uh, well, you're going to usually overestimate the amount of entanglement you have in your system. And if you are very close to the border here, actually like this can lead to false positives. So I mean, of course, that the idea here is that we have to rely on the assumption that we have well-characterized devices. We have a system, and we know uh, very well what we can, like what are the observables we can measure. So one way of uh, avoiding that, and so th this is what we would call like a device-dependent test. You have, to, you need to have a well, uh, a good characterization of the measurement devices you use in your experiment. So to avoid that. Uh, there is this idea of device independence. So basically, it tells us that we can perform tasks without really knowing too well what we are doing. So there are these tasks, these tasks that can be achieved without precise information about the inner mechanism of the physical device that we are using. We only rely on the statistical data that the, the experiment uh, returns to us. So in the case of entanglement detection, we have a state here, rho, could be like two particles. We send one particle to Alice, one particle to Bob. They can measure different properties of their systems. So like we tr this is what we call like also as a black box physics. We don't know what's going on inside these boxes here. We only know that some input state is entering. We are choosing some observable to measure that's labeled here by X for Alice and Y for Bob, and they obtain measurement outcomes, A, B. So the point here is that for any state that it's separable, that's not entangled, uh, we are going to have, like, the correlations that we can obtain in this experiment here, like P of A, B, the, me the outcomes A, B, given the measurement settings X and Y, is, is going to be, is, is going to have a decomposition of this form here. That if you know about Bell's theorem, this is just the local hidden variable model. And this decomposition here, that it's valid for any separable state, implies that any separable state should respect this inequality here. So, like, a sum of some of of some expectation values of different observables, A0 and A1 for Alice, B0 and B1 for Bob, and this should be smaller than 2. So we can understand that as an entanglement witness, 
But the point here is that this witness is valid for any observable that we can choose. A0, B0, B1, B0 and B1, they can be anything. For any observable, this uh, expression here is, needs to be smaller than 2 if the state that we have here is separable. So if we have an entangled state, usually, well, I mean, and we choose, pro uh, we choose properly what are the observables, we are going to violate this inequality here. And of course, this inequality is known as a Bell inequality, and the, it's an unambiguous proof of entanglement in the sense that we do not need to know what's the precise characterization of our device. Okay, you may say, well, okay, that's nice, but I actually have a well-characterized device, so why should I care about these things? Well, if you have a well-characterized device, maybe you, you don't need to care about that, unless you are uh, talking about uh, a, a cryptographic scheme. So like one of the applications of uh, coin information is exactly like to uh, exchange keys in a secure way, in a fundamentally secure way that does not rely on any uh, com computational complexity issues. And the point here is that most of the algorithms, like BB84 and all the uh, variations of it, so they are fundamentally secure in the sense that uh, an eavesdropper, like a quantum hacker if you, if you wish, um, cannot uh, gain information about the key that you want to exchange between two or more parties without like, uh, you noticing that this eavesdropper is there. But this only happens if you, uh, if you make some assumptions about your system. So as it was posted in this paper here, very precisely, in all proofs of the security of quantum key distribution, assumptions are made for the devices involved. However, the components used for experimental realizations of quantum key distribution deviate from the models in the security proofs. So, uh, and this is exactly the idea that they use to hack two commercially available uh, systems. One from ID Quantique in Geneva, and the other one I don't remember, but so like this is the first quantum hacker, Makarov. So he used it to go to conference like with this uh, setup here and like make uh, live demonstrations of how he could hack these uh, systems. So the point here is that, uh, so, Quantum mechanics allow us to make a fundamentally secure quantum key distribution, but we have to really have well characterized uh, um, systems. The point is that, again, using uh, Bell inequality, we can do that based now, in instead of like assuming that we have a well characterized system, we can like assume that we have full security, basically based on very mild assumptions, like free will and no superluminal communication. So, I mean, if you want to give up that, well, then you cannot do uh, quantum key distribution anymore, but there are many other things you cannot do, so I think it's fine. And, uh, well, this, this was uh, the seed of this, of this idea was in this paper from Arthur Eckert in 91, but since then, like, there is a, here's a very incomplete list of uh, works around this direction. So here's the first motivation, is the, is the motivation for why we care about uh, device independence. In the end of the day, of course, you go to, to the lab, you put your uh, favorite uh, quantum device, and you can do all of that. So a uh, second uh, set of motivations is, until now, I was talking about uh, this uh, Bell scenario, like the, this Bell inequalities in the usual sense. But we can go beyond that. And why to go beyond that? So uh, schematically, Bell's theorem refers to this uh, co very simple structure here. So here is like this lambda represents the source of states, like an um, uh, entangled pair of, of photons or whatever you like more. A and B here, they represent the measurement outcomes of the measurements performed by Alice and Bob, and X and Y are, are their measurement settings. So you see, this is very simple. Why not to go beyond that? And, there are, and in the recent years, many people have started to look to generalizations of these things. So here, like, we have some examples. Let me focus on this one here. So this would be, well, and recently, like, people also started talking about the quant like, very, uh, like, the quantum internet. So what this thing is going to be? It's going to be, like, a set of uh, nodes in a network that are, are connected by uh, entangled particles. And with these entangled particles, like, they will achieve uh, they will implement quantum in, uh, enhanced protocols, quantum cryptography, and all sorts of uh, quantum things. But the point here is that if you think in a usual network, what you have is not like a single source generating GZ states of a thousand particles and connecting thousand l laboratories. 
what you're going to have in practice is like a many different and independent sources of states, perhaps generating bipartite states, tripartite states that are going to connect in non-trivial ways, like this uh, network of laboratories. And the simplest example of that is this network here. It would be three nodes, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. And this is akin to the uh, entanglement swapping protocol, for those of you who know about that. So basically, we have Alice and Bob. They share a source of states here. And there is another independent source of state between uh, Bob, Bob and Charlie. And we can gen generalize that to something like this, or something like this, or even like allow for, for temporal, for like a communication between the different labs. So basically, like we are limited by our, our own imagination now. The problem with this, uh, so the like a boost in this field was like this idea of uh, trying to understand or like trying to generalize Bell's, te uh, Bell's theorem for these complex causal structures. And the basic problem that we face here is that uh, differently from the usual Bell scenario, characterizing these structures here, it's really a terribly complicated problem. It's a problem that we can use uh, methods from algebraic geometry. I've tried that. Believe me, like you don't want to do that. And even if you uh, manage to like find your way around this, uh, this math field, in the end of the day, what you're going to discover is that this field uh, gives you like some algorithms that are double exponential in the best cases. So it means that in practice, if you want to use this, this bazooka, you are going to be limited to very simple structures. So you cannot even treat things as simple as these here. Well, and the, well, the, the basic uh, reason for why this is so difficult is that uh, these, uh, these different complex networks here, in general, they are going to be characterized by non-convex sets. And, and here is where this uh, difficulty comes in. Uh, well, there have been many uh, advancements recently, developments, like here, again, is an incomplete list of things that people have discovered about these uh, complex uh, networks. But here in this work, you said, well, okay, going complex, it's nice, but what about the other way around, going simple? Is there anything we can learn by things that are different from this usual bell cause structure, but it's not as complicated as these things here? And the basic question that we are trying to solve, that we were trying to solve, and I think we have a very good answer now, is like, is there any true new notion of non-classicality that's not contained in the uh, seminal theorem by Bell? Or like uh, in the long term, what we would like to answer is what are the fundamental ingredients that the given causal structure, that the given network has to have in order to display this quantum classical mismatch? So this is the basic question. Okay, final motivation. All these things, they were motivated by this idea that Bell's theorem, it's a special case of a causal inference problem. So what's a causal inference problem? You give me some data, uh, some probability distribution, and you want to know what is the underlying physical mechanism, the underlying causal mechanism that generates this, uh, this uh, distribution that you are giving me. So this is the causal inference problem. It's a very important problem in many uh, areas of science. And the basic uh, question there is like, give me two variables, A and B, that are correlated, and you want to know if, this co is if these correlations are due to some direct, direct causation between A and B, or perhaps because of some uh, common ancestor, C, that generates the correlations between these two variables. And classically, we cannot do that. Like, uh, we are going to see more about that in the, in the next slides. But the point is that in this seminal paper from 2015, um, Katia Reed, and, uh, uh, that is a, she's a Brazilian, and Speckens and collaborators, they showed that in the quantum case, that's not true anymore. So like, uh, this was the first example of a quantum advantage in a causal inference problem. Okay, so this is uh, very simple. It's the simplest causal structure you can think of. And then this, the other motivation that, that we had to start like, looking at this problem was, well, okay, what about other causal structures? Could it be that like looking to other causal structures, we not only find this classical quantum mismatch, but also can find some sort of quantum advantage in the causal inference problem? So summing up everything, so here's the, there are many motivations, and I think to some extent we uh, provide answers to all of them. So the first one, can we witness non-classical behavior in a simple causal structure that furthermore is of relevance in causal inference because in this 
we have the hope of like finding some sort of quantum advantage. And so we can do that. And on the top of that, can we do that in a device independent manner? So it's this thing that I said before, in a way that does not rely on having a precise characterization of the object. Okay, so here's what we are going to see in the rest of the talk, like 25 minutes or so. Uh, so I I'm going to introduce first this instrumental scenario that I guess most of you are not don't know what it is. It's a really f uh, fantastic thing, very simple, very nice. Then we're going to see how quantum mechanics allows for uh, violations of the very basic principles underlying this, uh, this, this guy here. And then to end like some words about the experiments, the one done in Rome and the, on and the one done in Rio using a photonic system. Okay, so what's this instrumental scenario? Yeah, here's like you see, this is the, the causal inference problem. Like uh, if you put this spoon down, this is going to cause this thing that caused this and cause this. So like it's a chain of causation. So, so I, I think this illustrates well what's the causal inference problem. Um, okay, so this instrumental variables. Again, what's the basic problem that this field uh, faces? We have A and B and we want to know, well, okay, A and B, they have some correlations, meaning that P of AB does not factorize, is not equal to P of A times P of B. So we have uh, correlations between them, probabilistic correlations. The question now is, these correlations are due to some direct causation, like this arrow here, or perhaps this arrow is not there, there is no direct causation, What's and what's um, giving, uh, providing the correlations between A and B, it's a third event, lambda, that we might not observe directly, so we treat it as a latent, as a hidden factor that generates the correlations between the two of them. And the point here is that uh, simply relying on P of A, B, we cannot distinguish this arrow from, from this common answer here. So the very basic problem that, uh, of the field cannot be solved. Well, cannot be solved if we rely on what we call observational uh, data. That's like we just observe variables A and B and we see how they behave. Things change if we allow for interventions in the system. So what is an intervention? An intervention, uh, it's the act of like opening this black box, opening the box that, uh, that uh, rules the behavior of, of A and putting this box, this variable A, under our experimental control. So in practice, what this means is that if we can control a variable A, this, this, uh, this is equivalent of erasing all the incoming arrows, these causal arrows here, that, uh, are, that are incoming in this variable A. So we basically erase all these arrows, and now we have variable A under our own influence. And why this is nice? So you have a question? I'm going to talk about that now. So uh, do is how we represent or how the founders of the theory uh, re uh, represented this idea of an intervention. So P of BA is just the usual Bayesian probability. And P of B, given that I do A, is like I force A to be a value that it's under my experimental control. So I intervene on A, I do A of doing, of forcing this variable A to be uh, something that it's under my control. And now you see that if you are allow it to make interventions in your system, you can distinguish this arrow from these arrows here. And why is that? Well, because if I make interventions, actually what I'm doing is to erase this arrow here. So now if I observe correlations between A and B, and this arrow is not there anymore, these correlations can only be due to direct causation between A and B. So think of like this uh, Marlboro problem. Uh, we see correlations between smoking and cancer. Are these correlations due to the fact that smoking causes cancer or perhaps there is a genetic defect or like a mutation and this was like the uh, case made by Malboro that causes people to be more likely to smoke and at the same time to develop cancer. How could we solve that? Well, we could intervene in the problem. We could force people to smoke. But of course we don't want to do that, right? So again, this is a very nice idea because like uh, th theoretically it shows that the causation can be uh, can be made uh, experimentally accessible, but it's not uh, in many cases ethical or possible. So again, still the basic problem is there. The question is then: Can we do that without relying on interventions, without making, without forcing people to smoke? And that's precisely 
where this guy here comes in. We, this is uh, exactly uh, the role or like why this instrumental variable X has been introduced. So we have the same thing as before, variables A and B, perhaps some causation here, perhaps some latent factor that generate correlations between A and B. But now we have this new variable here, X, that it's the instrumental. So how, how these things work? Um, first historical remark is that these instrumental variables that were introduced in the context of econometrics. By this guy here, he was trying to estimate some uh, p uh, parameters in a linear model of supply and demand that he had, and then he realized, well, okay, if I introduce this guy here, I'm able to do that. So what, what was his problem? So here, like you can think, this is uh, the B is the demand and A is the supply, and he had some reasons to believe that they were connected by this li by this linear equation here. So like this gamma would be the uh, to some extent like the causal strength of this arrow here that connects A and B. But A and B they could also have some correlations due to some unknown latent factor. And the problem that he had was well, how can I estimate from empirical data the value of this of this gamma here. And then what he realized was that putting this variable x here, he could do precisely that. So this variable x is the instrument that it's uh, allowed to have some direct causal influence over the supply, over the variable A, but does not have any direct influence over the variable B, the demand. And it's also independent of this variable lambda here. But now if x is independent of lambda, I just multiply x on this side of the equation. On this side, I take the covariance. And because the covariance between x and lambda, it's zero because they are assumed to be independent, I arrive at this very simple equation here. Lambda is just like, uh, so having, uh, knowing the observable correlations, not interventional ones between x and b and x and a, I'm allowed to estimate this, uh, this parameter. So this was the uh, historical uh, reason for the invention of that, uh, of these instrumental variables. But of course here we have something that it's against the very first slide of my talk. This is device dependent. The guy had a model for, for his system, but we want to do things in a device independent way. And then we have to rely on this uh, seminal paper, really fantastic paper from Pearl, and he's a student. Pearl is like the inventor of this theory of causality. So what they did was to uh, come up with this idea of the average causal effect that you can think of as a measure of causality that's device independent. So basically how, how this thing is defined. So let's think here. If A has some causal influence over B, and I intervene on A, forcing A to be the, ver the, the value A, then I'm going to have some value of B. And if I do A prime, then I should have a different value of B. But so the point here is if A has no causal influence over B, whatever I do on A is not going to change B, right? So this measure here is going to be zero. But if A do have some, uh, some causal influence over B, changing the value of A, like erasing this arrow here, like forcing A to be something that it's under my experimental control, this is illustrated here, then if, there, if this arrow is there, if there is direct causation between A and B, then I should see shifts in the probability of B depending on what I force A to be, A or A prime. And then I just take this uh, supremum here. And then the, fa the fantastic thing comes, so this, this again, it's like a quantity that in principle you could uh, estimate from your experiment if you do interventions, if you force people to, s to smoke. But what they realized is that you could put very strict bounds on this quantity here even without, without doing interventions, even without forcing people to smoke. Basically looking at the probability distribution that you get out of this experiment here, P of A, B, X, you can put bounds on what is this uh, quantity here. So it's like uh, you, have, uh, expert, you, you have empirical data that tells you what would be the value of a potential intervention in your system. So this is like the power of a counterfactual reasoning. And not surprisingly, this thing here has become like uh, really important in, in many fields. Like uh, when you want to know if a drug uh, is good to like uh, reduce cholesterol levels or whatever, like uh, to uh, treat some disease, the clinical trial that people do, it's actually something like that. Or like this also has applications in ecology, economy, like you just name it. Okay, so uh, you see that uh, for all of that to, to make sense, I have to uh, be sure that I have a good instrument. And what a good instrument means here. 
I have something that does not have a direct causation of, over this variable b, and it's independent of the potential uh, latent factors that might affect a and b. So let me give an example here. Like in a, in a clinical trial, what this thing here would be. Like I have X, this would be like a doctor that gives a pill that it's either the real drug or placebo. A would be the compliance of the patient, like you receive a pill and I don't know, maybe you, you take it, maybe you put it in the trash, right? And B would be the recovery of this patient. And there might be several factors that like affect at the same time uh, the compliance of the, of the uh, patient and its uh, recovery. So I mean, it seems fine to say that uh, uh, if like uh, the fact that the doctor gives drug or placebo, it's independent of these latent factors and it's also like independent of the recovery. Well, it's dependent of the recovery, but of course like not in a direct way, not in a direct way. Like the recovery depends on the treatment via the compliance of the, uh, of the um, patient, right? But now let's say that we do a bad uh, clinical trial, meaning that uh, the doctor like has a blue pill for the real drug and a red one for the placebo. And the patients, they discover that. In this case, it's not fine anymore to, to say that we do not have direct causation. If the patients, they, they realize that, well, that's exactly the point of the placebo, right? They have some recovery, like independently of their compliance. Okay, so this makes important to be sure that we do have a good instrument. And that's precisely the meaning of these instrumentality inequalities. This is very similar to what we have in Bell's theorem. Like, uh, if we have a good instrument, meaning that this is the underlying cause structure that governs our experiment, then uh, this is going to impose uh, constraints, very strict constraints, on the correlations, on the distributions P of A, B, X, compatible with, with such thing. And one of these is like this inequality here that's known as an instrumental inequality. So this inequality tells us that any correlation or any distribution, P of A, B, conditioned on X, compatible with such underlying causal mechanism, should respect this, should, should respect this inequality. So this is very, like, we would call this a Bell inequality, but they are not aware of us, so they call this uh, instrumental inequalities. Because this, this was invented in 95, like uh, 30 years later than uh, the, the theorem of Bell. So, I mean, it's okay, they, they were not aware of us, but we would call this uh, Bell inequalities. The point is that if we violate this inequality, then we have a proof that we do have a bad instrument. So what, uh, or at least classically, a violation of any of these instrumental inequalities here would mean that, well, either we have direct causation between our instrument and the variable B, the recall variable, or like perhaps we have some correlations between the treatment that uh, the doctor assigns to the patients and their uh, common history here. Okay, so in summary, what we have, like this instrument scenario, again, it's like really important in many different fields, basically any field where you are interested in doing causal discovery or causal inference. And it has two pillars. The first one, well, we can estimate this average ca causal effect from observational data. So this is a quantity that it's defined in terms of interventions, in terms of making people smoke, but we can estimate what's its value independently of making people smoke. So it's a very powerful counterfactual reasoning. And the other pillar is this idea that we can, to some extent, test if we have a good instrument or not. Basically, we take our data and we check if these inequalities are violated or not. If they are not violated, we cannot really be sure that we do not have an error here, but at least we know that our data is compatible with such a model. But if we violate one of these inequalities, then we are sure we do have a bad instrument. So we better repeat our um, experiment. The point now is can, can we change these conclusions here if, uh, ins if we allow for quantum effects in this, uh, in this uh, scenario? And that's exactly what, what happens. So what would be, there are different ways we can do, we can make this uh, instrumental scenario uh, quantum. We take here and, and we are working on all of them basically. But here I'm going to show you like the simplest possible way we can uh, make this guy quantum. So X, A, and B are still classical variables, classical random variables. But now we say that instead of having a classical Latin factor lambda, this guy here now could be an entangled state. This meaning that then A and B 
because they are classical variables, we can interpret them as the results of measurements performed on this entangled state. So just using the Born rule, we arrive at this quantum probability here of a, b given x, just the trace over some operators over some, um, some state row here that could be, well, it's a quantum state, so it could be entangled. And notice here that uh, uh, the operator, the measurement operator for, for b can depend on the measurement outcome of a. So here comes the crucial difference to a Bell scenario. So the first thing we did was, well, okay, so let's take here some entangled state. Here's like the paradigmatic of Werner state. Uh, with uh, visibility V, we have a maximum entangled state. When with the complement one minus V, we have a pure noise, random noise. We chose some measurement um, settings here. And then uh, we can, and then like, well, okay, I, I didn't said that, but this inequality here, proven in a paper by uh, of 2015, it cannot be violated by quantum mechanics. So it means that whatever is the state and the, and the uh, and the measurement settings that we choose here, we are not going to violate this inequality. And this inequality is the only inequality bounding the case where x... Uh, it's a paper by Hanson, uh, Law, and Pusey from uh, Perimeter Institute. I can, I can send you the reference. Well, but, but we are going to find some quantum violations in, uh, in one or two slides. Okay, so they, they proved that this inequality cannot be violated quantum mechanically. So meaning that like whatever we choose here, we are going to have some probability distribution that is compatible with such instrumental scenario. But we said, well, okay, so is there anything, is there any sort of like a quantum signature that it's not, that it's not just the violation of these instrumental inequalities? And indeed, that's the case. So we can use this uh, expression that I had before here, this bound, to compute what's the value of A's for this, uh, for this, uh, for this state and these measurement settings. And we find here like an expression of this kind. So for V larger than 0 0.8, it's positive. And you see like for V equal to 1, so for a maximally entangled state, this would be like uh, 0 0.16. So I mean, it's A's that it's considerable, right? Like uh, you see a shift in the, in the probability of 0.16. This is a uh, unitless. It has no units here because we are talking about uh, probabilities. Okay, so, but this is based on the classical description of, of this problem, right? This, this bound here, like this bound that I showed before, it's based on the classical description of this experiment. And then the first thing we did was, well, okay, what happens if instead of having a classical description, we have a quantum one? And then what we found was that this A is equal to zero. So I, I, I'm going to, to show next why this is the case, but the, uh, f this is the first result we had. Well, what this is showing us is that if quantum effects are present and we use the classical theory of causality, this could lead to an overestimation of causal influences. I'm not saying that uh, in a clinical trial quantum effects are going to be present, but let's say that they were. So maybe if, if, this qu if these effects were there, like a, a medicine, that we would assume to be to like be curing some disease. Actually, it's not because we are overestimating this quantity here. I'm not saying this is going to happen, but like uh, let's say that now instead of like uh, we are interested not in the causation between a um, medicine and a disease, but like uh, perhaps the causation between two photons, two atoms, two ions, whatever. We better use the right theory that it's the quantum theory of causality and not the classical one. And to see why this guy here is zero in the quantum case, it's very simple. So what would be like the most general intervention we can think in the quantum case? So here we have an a entangled state, like Alice receives this her part of the entangled state. And what would be an intervention? She just throw, uh, throw this out, like say, well, I don't care what's this quantum system. I prepare a new one and I measure this new one. Or she also like prepares nothing. She just say, well, I just put this quantum system in the trash, and I force A to be like a classical value that it's under my control. But from Bob's perspective, what Alice is doing is just to trace out her system. So from Bob's perspective, what he has, the state he has, is the trace over A of this state here. But you can see very easily that the state, the marginal state of Bob, is just pure noise. It's just identity over two. 
So if the state of Bob is identity over two, it doesn't matter what Alice sends to him. Always, if he measures here some, uh, pr some projective observable, whatever is, is the observable that he chooses, the probability of getting an outcome plus or minus, spin up or spin down, is going to be the same. It's going to be half. So this, mean that this means that this ace, it's going to be zero because it doesn't, like the value of B doesn't depend on A anymore. Again, so this is nice. We were very excited, like uh, showing that. Uh, and we can, to some extent, interpret that as some sort of quantum advantage in, the, in this uh, scenario here. Because, well, something that you can achieve classically only with positive causal influence, you can achieve quantumly without it, like with a quantum influence that it's, with a causal influence that it's zero. We were happy, but not so happy because this is device dependent. Device dependent in the sense that like interventions, they can only be done if you know what's going on inside the black box. You cannot like do an intervention if you don't know like a, so, well, I mean, so this brings us even more complicated problems of what would be really like an intervention in, in the quantum case. I have no idea and I don't want to enter in that, but uh, we said, okay, so can we do this in a device independent manner? And this seemed complicated because what would be a way of doing this in a device independent manner? Well, it would be to violate an instrumental inequality. But we knew from this paper from 2014, 15, that this could not be done. But then we said, well, okay, but this is for a specific class of inequalities. What about new classes of inequalities? So that's what we did. We derived a new instrumental inequality, that it's this guy here. It's like the expectation value, for example, this here expectation value of the variable B, conditioned on the fact that the instrumental variable is one, and similarly to, to, to the other terms. And we could prove that uh, classically, like if this process here is classical, it's bounded by three, but putting here a maximally entangled state, we could violate this guy here by this quantity, one plus two square root of two. So this is nice, because now we really have a quantum class gap that it's device independent. And more than that, uh, we can, sorry? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, 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 like the sum of the uh, expectation values for a classical model should give a quantity that's smaller than three. You, you get three point eight two. Uh, that that this is bigger than three. Oh, well, this is three point eight two. Okay. Yeah. It's three. It's three point eight two. <laughs> um, so the other. Well, we are so used to this, uh, num to this uh, magical number here that, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so we can also relate this uh, violation here to its classical uh, counterpart. So what I mean with that? Classically, to have a violation of this inequality, this can only be achieved if we violate some of the causal assumptions that underlie this model. So, for example, if we have a narrow direct causation between X and B, and we can quantify this, this, this guy here by a quantity that's similar to this ace that I said before. And what we can show is that the violation of this inequality is directed, related to the minimum causal influence a classical model need to have to explain this data. So, but, but the important point here is that we are shaking the other pillar of, of this area. Classically, a violation of this inequality would mean that, well, we have a bad instrument. But if quantum effects are present, that's not the case anymore. Because we, we do have a good instrument here. Like uh, X does, is independent of the, of, of the quantum state, and all its influence over B is mediated by, via this variable A. But the point here is that well, this changes the, inter the interpretation of the violation of uh, instrumental inequality. So if quantum effects are present, and you violate one of these inequalities, this doesn't mean that you have a bad instrument. It may, it may mean that, but it can also mean that uh, actually you have quantum effects that are present. So I have uh, five minutes. Let me focus, uh, well, let, let me focus on this here because I think it's pretty important. So this is the usual Bell scenario. Alice and Bob, because they are so far apart, space like it's separated, there is no direct uh, causation between these two variables. So we can interpret the usual Bell scenario in this instrumental sense as saying that, well, x is the instrumental variable of the variable A, and y is that measurement setting of Bob is the instrument, it's, its instrumental variable. But now, 
if you think a little bit, you see that this here, it's pretty much connected to that via this new causal model here. So it's like a Bell model, but where now we allow uh, the measurement outcome of Alice to determine or like to have some causal influence via this dashed arrow here over what's the measurement input of Bob. So this is a non-local hidden variable model because even if the if the two parties are like a space like it's se separated, we do have like instantaneous sort of communication between them. And furthermore, it's a model that allows for measurement dependence in the sense that look, lambda determines what's A and A determines what's the, what's the input of Bob. So it's like if Bob has no free will. So that's nice because the, what this is proving is that uh, if you go to the papers in the literature and you have some data like out of a Bell experiment that violates this inequality, actually what this data is proving is not that quantum mechanics is incompatible with local hidden variable models as you would get out of Bell's theorem. Actually, what is proving is that uh, quantum mechanics is the correlations you get, you, you get out, of, out of it are much stronger than that, since they are incompatible even with this much stronger class of uh, non-local hidden variable models with, with measurement de dependence. Okay, so I'm going to skip that, but uh, we can also make a connection with, with steering. Let, let me only describe with that uh, uh, what's that, and then I, I go to my conclusions. So here what we, what we did before wa was to treat variables x, a, and b as uh, classical variables and allow for some quantumness, like a quantum node here in the source. But we can also open these other boxes. And then what we did was like the next step was not only to make this guy here quantum, but also to make the variable b quantum. And this is connected to those of you who know about that with uh, steering. And then what we can prove that is that uh, uh, the quantum and classical predictions, they do not coincide again, and this leads us to a stronger form of steering than what was previously known. Okay, so uh, we did experiments in both cases, like, uh, so just a quick word here. In the case of uh, violating the instrumental inequality, this was a very nice experiment because you see here, this is different from a Bell experiment. What we wanted was to impose a causal structure where A is in the past of, of Bob, where, where Alice is in the past of Bob. So we did that with uh, entangled photons, so like two photons here entangled in polarization. One goes to Alice, Alice measure, measures her qubit here, her system here, records what the outcome, and she sends this information to Bob, and Bob here has a device that allows him to change what's the measurement that he's going to, per, uh, to perform on his system, depending on what Alice got here. But of course, we are talking about photons, they are very fast, so we had to put a very long delay line here in order to allow things to be performed here before performing them on Bob's lab. And this delay line introduced a lot of uh, errors and noise and so on, so it took some time to, to get the experiment running, but we could find a violation. So remember, the bound there, the classical bound was three, and the best experiment they performed, we got like 3.6 basically. So we got a very good violation of this inequality. In Rio, they performed uh, an experiment regarding this the uh, steering results, and they could show like uh, this stronger form of uh, steering. Also, hmm? the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, UFRJ. Well, the, the quantum optics group there, uh, where Leandro, uh, Luis, and Steve are. Um, okay, so we are really excited about all of that. We really think this is very fundamental, and we are working hard on, on many uh, directions here. So we are, like, one of the things we are doing is, like, uh, making everything quantum. So we make every node in this uh, instrumental scenario quantum, and we see what we get out of it. Of course, this, this is going to have many applications. We don't know them yet, but I'm sure they are there, like... Uh, cryptography, self-testing, distributed computing. So I, I think this is really like a very strong, uh, well, I mean, it's something that we would like to, to motivate the uh, community, but work ourselves on that. And one thing that I'm particularly interested in is the multipartite generalization of this instrumental scenario. And the thing here is that we, like, we can do that, but the first question we would like to solve here is if 
these multipartite generalizations, where instead of, of having Alice, Bob, now we have Alice, Bob, Charlie, and David, and so on and so forth, if they actually mean something in a purely classical scenario. Like if these multipartite uh, generalizations would, would mean anything in a purely classical case. And yeah, like uh, we really think this, this is a very nice result that could be extended in many directions. And we are, yeah, if you're interested, just talk to us. And well, with that, I, before finishing, just to bring to your attention that uh, with Rodrigo, we are going, and also Dimitri, that are professors here in the institute, we are going to organize some events next year, some of them related to, to this topic. So if you are interested, please um, stay tuned. They are going to be announced soon. And with that, I thank you.